Okay, so I'm going to start the recording. Um, so we post all the recordings to our YouTube channel from our website. So you can go back and see the last two and a half years now of things, topics we've covered. And you'll see we cover everything. Like 40 videos or something else. Yeah. Crazy how many of these done. Yeah. And some we forgot to hit record on. So there are a few <laughs> things that we could probably redo um, yeah. because we forgot to hit record. Um, and I have to look back and see what those were. Um, we have a lot of recordings. But today I wanted to present um, kind of an introduction to Selenium. Um, so I'll share my screen and see if I can find it. Chrome. There we go. Share screen. And so to get started, um, I guess the first starting place is I'm going to be using Google Colab to run it in. Um, if you're not familiar with Colab, it's basically Jupyter Lab or Jupyter Notebooks Lab that Google runs and they allow you to run your code on their servers. Um, and it ramps up um, on the free service, it ramps up when resources are available. Mm -hmm. So if you want to run something heavy, it will make GPUs available to you if they are free, but you don't know when that will be because people who are paying for the service get first in line. Um, so you can pay for what they call their pro, Colab Pro, and then you get to move to the head of the line for resources for compute power. Um, and with the free service, they allow you to start up a virtual machine and it will run for 12 hours. And then you either have to restart it or it just gets turned off. Um, so it's not really good for running long-term projects. It's better just for trying things out. No. And so I use it a lot for that. And they do that you put almost anything on it and then it goes away after 12 hours. Um, so we do have a Jupyter Lab instance here at GW you can use. So you can have Jupyter Notebooks through your GW account, your singles log on. Um, but what they don't allow you to do is install anything you want onto it and then take it away. Because if you want things on it, you can write the library and they will put software that you want onto their server. But if you... Um, don't want to go through the hassle, you can just do it in Colab and they let you pretty much put anything you want onto it and then it takes it away. Um, and so it's nice, this, what I'm presenting on using Selenium doesn't really use the resources. So it's not like I'm gonna to have to use GPUs to do the mm -hmm. thing that I'm doing. Um, but with the free account, you will max out and will crash at times if you try to do things that are just too big, like things with audio or video. You'll see the little, up here I'll tell you like how much RAM you're using. You'll see it'll just go right to the top and then it'll crash everything. Um, so then that's when you have to move to the paid account to get more access to more compute power through the GPUs. Um, but all in all, it's a great service. It's a great tool to use, um, especially just when you want to try out some things, post it. Um, it's only, they only have the um, Python kernel available though. So you can't do R, even though you can use Jupyter Notebooks for R. Yeah. If you have the kernel, they only have a Python kernel. And GW, we only have a Python kernel. Um, That's been a big issue. Mostly for collaborative teaming. I have, I have student teams who are working on projects at the same time they just pass around a code file because there's no, or they put it on like Dropbox. But I thought you had uh, our server. Yeah. Oh. I guess. <laughs> well, I, I put that up before the pandemic and then we lost all of our GW, our, our C's computing got merged into the general. We had, C's had its own internal computing services. Oh, okay. So that got blown up. So I lost everything I was working with. And Can't I, they just put it on an AWS server? For um, yeah, we could, we could do it again. I just, yeah, never got it. to it. And yeah. Anyway, it'd be really nice to work in like collab for for collaborative pro, you know projects. But yeah, so the I guess you can talk at the library too and see if they'll put an R kernel on. 
our Jupiter really Lab. Like, why don't we have an R? <laughs> yeah, it's on there. Like if you go to their about page where it talks about how you get resources and how they decide where to allocate them. It yeah. does say somewhere in here that they know that R has been requested many times. Yeah, yeah see, it's is. right down here. Yeah. Support. But they don't have I would like to support these, but not yet at ATA. Yeah, that's why yeah. I've been that way for a while. Anyway. Yeah, and I don't know how much they um do it. Anything you create in your collab space is saved onto your Google Drive, like your code is. Yeah. Any files that you develop, you have to download or they disappear. So mm -hmm. like if you print out something or you save a data file. When your virtual machine goes down, it goes away, um, unless you've saved it. Your code is fine, though. It'll save all your Python files. Um, so again, great resource. Um, and what I wanted to use it for for this was Selenium um, and just talking about some Selenium, some of the different use cases um, where it might be useful. It's a very useful tool when you want something like it. It doesn't do a whole lot of things, but what it does is very useful at certain times. The last time I was using it, um, I'll bring up. So over the summer, as I mentioned at one of our other meetings, um, we developed a website with tutorials for using, for learning to code in different disciplines. Um, and people can post these tutorials. And what I wanted was when people post a tutorial that we get in screenshot of the tutorial from the actual website and put that image onto the page. So I wanted to grab that screenshot and save it and then use that on the page. And Selenium is a great tool for doing that um, and doing other things too, but that was what I was using it for. And so that's kind of what I wanted to talk about today. Um, so to get started, you have to install Selenium. Um, and when you're working in CoLab, they do the exclamation pip. Um, and you also then have to update your Ubuntu. Um, I'm not sure if that's how you really pronounce it, but. Mm -hmm. um, however you pronounce it, you want to update it as well. And that's what the apt get is for that. Um, until putting this together, I just knew you use pip or you use um, apt get, and I never knew what the difference was. You just did what was ever is there. So I looked it up and that's what the difference is. One is just for Python and one's for, um, I guess, Ubuntu or whatever. And then just the apt actually works pretty much across Linux and with Damien. And that's why you're using different ones. But they're all doing the same thing. They're just installing software for you, basically. Um, then I call the software and import the web driver function because that's what we're going to be using it for. So the concept behind Selenium is if you want to have a web browser type of functioning to test things out to see how things work. You can do it without actually having to uh, have the whole browser installed, the user interface and all that. So basically it creates a virtual web browser on your server that then you can work with and manipulate things um, without having to actually have it on your computer running. And, and so if you want, you can run a thousand of them and log in as a thousand different people and do it all in a fraction of time. And so you can automate a lot of things where you want a web browser type of interaction. Um, so we're going to get the web driver. And specifically, I'm going to bring in the Chrome web driver. Um, so the Chromium Chrome web driver. They also have uh, Firefox if you um, prefer to use Firefox or if you're testing across, you can bring in both and then test. Do you get the same results no matter which browser you're using or can you break it in one browser and not in the other? But for this, I'm just using Chrome. Um, so, and we're then in 
put in a couple of arguments just to help it run a little bit faster and better. Um, so we're going to run it headless. So it won't, when it brings it in and installs it, it won't have the history, the login, linking to your Gmail account. None of those user interface things come with it. It's just the browser part of it. Um, and then we're going to go without a sandbox. Another thing I didn't know why I always did, but I always knew you put it in, but it actually turns off some security features that allows it to work better. Um, and it's security features related to your user account, but since you've turned off all the user stuff, that's not there anyway, so you don't have to have the security because you're not logging into the browser as a user. Um, and then we're then to remove a partition thing that tends to, it has something to do with the amount of RAM the browser has access to, and it tends to crash things. So, so we'll turn those things off with our version. Um, and then I'm also going to import time just so that um, I can use it to sleep. Because sometimes when you're calling things, if you call them too quickly, then it will um, not have time to load the page and you won't get what you're looking for. So I guess first I'll go ahead and install. Make sure everything is installed and running. So again, this is just putting this onto my virtual machine at this point so that I can work with it. Um, uh, can I download the code from GitHub or somewhere? Else? Um, yeah, I guess I can put it on GitHub or okay. um, I can send it to you too. Oh, or, um, is this you can't share the whole workbook or make it read? No, read I can. Own? I can share. Yeah, and you make can it. share. And you can share just code. You can share without code. You can. Okay. Decide what you want to share. You could do that. And if you send it to me, I'll just post it on YouTube. Oh, that's like true. In the comment of the YouTube. Of yeah. If you want to access Just say file, moving it over to GitHub. Um, right. So the first thing I'm going to do, just to show you an example. Um, so we're going to initiate our Chrome driver in our first line. Um, and then I'm going to tell it to go to our website, our um, website for GW coders. I'm gonna have it sleep just for one second to make sure that the full page loads before it takes then a screenshot of that page and saves that as test PNG, so. That's when you always panic when you're live coding. It's like, will it actually run? Who knows? And it did. Um, so now you'll see over here on the left, I have my test PNG file it created. And if I download that, um, I'll just keep naming everything <laughs> test. And it looks like that. And there it is. So that's a screenshot of our website um, that we took automatically. And you can see there's no, so this is a screenshot of the whole browser window and there's no user interface stuff at the top. There's no tabs or anything like that. That's the things we took away, but that is our website. Um, you can also set like how wide you want it to be. Like it, this is a little narrower than I keep my screen. So, but it doesn't really matter for this. Um, so yeah, that is a quick way to get a screenshot. Um, and that's basically what I was doing for mine. I just wanted, I. Every time someone um, adds a tutorial to our database, it goes to the link and takes a screenshot of it and then uses that as um, the clickable link when it comes back. So we save that screenshot so we don't have to take it every time someone loads the page. Um, and then I, at the last line, I go ahead and I quit the driver. Um, so you wouldn't have to quit the driver every time because they will shut it off for you. Um, but they prefer if you don't use up their resources. So basically you're turning off the browser. And so it's not sitting there on the system. Uh, so the next example then, um, since it is a web browser, you can also interact with the web browser through code. Um, and for that, they have 
you can import part of the Selenium package. It's called buy. Um, and that allows you to select things by whatever you want. So you can select it. Um, in this case, we're then select it by the text within the link. So whatever the link is named, that's what we're going to look for. Um, so again, we'll restart our driver in our first line, line five. We'll again go to the same website. We'll pause for a second. So everything is the same. But now what we're going to do is we're going to find that link. So we're going to use the driver. We're going to find an element where the link text is learn. So if we go back and look at the website again, oh, um, I have a button, a link here called learn. And that's actually what I want to, sorry, I accidentally started Roblox and my kids play Roblox on my computer. Um, <laughs> they play Roblox everywhere they can. So let me try to get that off before it. Okay, so back to the code. We're then to find that link that is called learn. We're then to click it, and then we're then to wait a second and take the screenshot of it. So I'll run the code again. And now we should have a different image in that test file. Yeah, so now it's scrolled down to the learn area of the website and it took the screenshot of that. Um, so you can interact with the site to get to places that you want to get to. And using the buy, um, so without getting too much into HTML, but these are all HTML tags and XPath tags that are in the website, driving any of the websites. Um, so as I said, I was looking for the text because I saw the link and it was called learn. And so I could use that. I could also have looked and found out like what was the name of that link um, in the, the name of the link in the element. Um, so elements, get names and they get IDs and stuff. And so you can go by any of those. So it doesn't have to necessarily go by if it has text. Um, you can use other ways of identifying those elements. If you're not familiar with HTML, this may seem a little odd, but if you are at all familiar with HTML, all of this seems fairly straightforward and normal stuff that we would do. And you could pick that up real easily. Um, just go to any HTML tutorial and you'll understand all of this pretty quickly. But it's very helpful because then you can go in and um, identify all different types of elements you may want to interact with within a website. Um, and that also includes that you can fill out forms on the website. So let's say that in this case, um, I want to fill out a search form on Google and I want to take a picture of the results from that search. So to do that, we're then going to import the keys. Um, so last time we imported the buy, now we're importing keys so that we can use keys. And that's what allows you to basically type into the browser that doesn't really exist on your computer, but does exist somewhere. Um, so we'll start up our driver again. We'll go to Google this time. Again, we'll find the element and I'm going to search for the element and the name of it. When I went to Google and inspected it, they named their search box Q. And so that's what element we want. We're then at first clear it to make sure there's nothing in it from a previous search. Um, there won't be because we haven't searched anything. But if we did a second round and a third round, let's say we wanted to search 500 different keywords, and we wanted to bring back the first response from each of those, we would want to clear our query each time. Um, and so then we have it type in GW coders, we hit the return key, and then we take the image of it. 
and I'll run that. And there we go. So now if I download the image again, if everything went as it should. So there is the Google search results for GW coders. Um, now I don't know why you would really want an image of that, but I was just showing that that it actually does go there. It does work mm -hmm. like it's supposed to work. Um, if you just a note, like if you do this without the headless version, it will actually open up a browser on your computer. So you can run those commands and then you go to that browser and see that it's navigated or it's done those, it's executed the thing. But I think, but I mean, if you're working in Colab, it makes sense to kind of leave it headless because you don't want browsers mm -hmm. popping up and leave it. That's what I've done in the past. I've, well, I don't think it'll, if you're in Colab, it won't pop up on your no. computer because it's on their computer, right. not so your I mean, computer. But if you're running yeah. Selenium like on your own machine on uh, local Python okay. and you do it not headless, you'll actually get a browser pop up and you can see it. Like you're basically remote controlling that browser uh, in real time. But the screenshot, this is this is what I tend to do in practice too, is like just take a screenshot to see where the browser's at. Like, yeah, it, it went where I went, why I would expect it, and, and keep moving forward. Okay. Um, now, of course, that's not all that useful, what we just did, because you could just go to Google and then do search question mark Q and put in whatever terms you want. And you can just easily. So if you were actually going to be doing web scraping, you probably wouldn't use Selenium for that task because you could just pull by URL. Um, but now that doesn't always work if, like we saw two weeks ago when um, Purab presented on Ajax and you get dynamic searching, then nothing changes in the URL. So you wouldn't find those things. Um, and I'll show an example of that in a little bit. Uh, so not that useful, but it does illustrate how you can do that. Um, so if you did want to scrape with Selenium, um, they have some tools for doing that that are helpful. Um, we won't really, I'll use them in a couple of screens down, but I'm just installing them here. So let's just do, for example, I'll go to Reddit um, and just pull one page and the top listings from that page. And then I'll have the driver bring back the page source, which is very um, easy scraping stuff to do. So it's getting it and now it's bringing it back. So this is all the HTML that runs, I guess I can show the page. <laughs> it's a lot. It's a lot. Um, yeah, I'll just, hide that for now. Um, it's all there, but that is this page's HTML text here. So if I come over. So that is this page here, um, which is just, if you go to Reddit, not logged in or anything. Um, actually, I'll log out to make sure. Where's my log out? Yeah, it's actually this page here because this is a logged out page, which is what Selenium is getting because they're not logging in at this point. Um, so it's the learning program, the last top post from the last week on Reddit. Again, not that interesting. There's lots of ways you could scrape that without having to install Selenium to do it for any reason. But it does allow you to start doing more interesting types of things. Um, so now what I want to do is I want to scrape Reddit this time, but I want to scrape my own Reddit account, not the general account, which is something that you can't do just based on the URL because you have to be logged in to get to it. And this is when Selenium gets more useful and more powerful. Um, so again, we'll start up our driver. Um, I'm loading pandas and beautiful soup. Beautiful soup is a web scraping app. Um, package for Python. And everyone knows what pandas is for, I would think. Um, though I did learn this week that pandas are not named for the animal. It's panel data. Um, that's what pandas is for. 
I always thought it was named after the cute animal. So, so again, we'll start up our um, driver. We'll go to Reddit again. This time, what we'll do is we'll use the buy link text and find the button that says login, and we will click that button. Um, and then what happens with Reddit, just to show you, I guess that probably helps too. So I just am telling it to go here, find a button called login and click it. Now, what happens with Reddit that doesn't happen with all systems is they pop theirs up in an iframe. Um, so this white box in HTML language, we call an iframe. It's an inserted frame into another HTML document. Um, some websites do this, some don't. This one does, so I had to tell it to then go into the iframe. So within Selenium, you can switch to, um, and actually you can switch the tabs in this if you wanna get into tabbing, but in this case, I just wanna switch to the frame and I'm telling it which frame. So in order to figure that out, I just was here, I went to the site, I right clicked and did inspect. And somewhere up in here, uh, top above that. Somewhere in here, yeah. I, right above it, the login, the main last one. Yeah. Okay, well, somewhere in there, I figured out which, what is the iframe? And it has what's called an XPath element, and it's listed there. And I just copied and pasted it from there to here and said, find the iframe because I want to be in the iframe. And then within the iframe, I just kept using the XPath because that's what I kept seeing. I want to go to the element. In this case, I want to click here, the username element where I put my name in. And so I tell it to go to there. I make sure it's clear. Then I type in the words, we share science was the name that I had for this account. And then I hit return. And then I find the element that has the password. I clear it. And then I log in with the password, which for this, since this is being taped, I'm not showing what the password is. It's saved somewhere else, um, but it's just, um, the password and then hit return again. So now what we've done is we've clicked login and we put in the username and the password, and then we're gonna click the login button. I'll take another screenshot of that then, just so I can see what I'm looking at. Um, and then I'll actually scrape all the, the information of what it looks like when I'm logged into Reddit um, and I'm going to put that, I'm going to, since Reddit comes in little chunks, um, and want the titles, the upvotes and who the authors were. Um, and then I'll just use beautiful soup to make that look better and to put it into a pandas data frame. Um, so the bottom part, this is really the web scraping part where I'm taking the data off of my Reddit account and I'm putting it into a pandas data frame, the parts I want of it. Whereas this top part of the code is really what Selenium is doing. But it just is a lot cooler if you see what happens. So, so I'll run this. Yep. Can you please fill me in a little bit like it's very hard to see what's on the Um if I get it too much bigger, I'm not sure if I'll be able to when this stuff prints out, it may have a problem. Let me see. I can move the font up to, let's see if I take it up to 28. My, okay, yeah. yeah, it starts to run off the edge is the only issue. Um, so I'll run it and we'll see. So with Colab, there's a little green dot that's going down showing where we are in the code. So now we're down here, we're sleeping for five seconds. Um, because when I actually logged into my Reddit account, it does take a couple of seconds to repopulate. So I knew I wanted to put a sleep in there. Um, 
So again, I'll download the picture I took. I wonder if we already have the cookie in our local computer. Can we just use that cookie to log? Yeah, you can access cookies. Um, I, I didn't do it for this demonstration, but oh. yeah, Selenium has a way of, yes. you can set and access cookies if you want to. Um, so yeah, so now this is my, if I logged into Reddit, this is the first page that would pop up for me. And you can see I have a little, I am logged in. It no longer says login, it, I am logged in. So this is my account. So this is really helpful. Like if you wanted to scrape a job search site, what they provide on the public isn't that much, but if you wanted to log into your account and then do it, um, you can use Selenium. Um, Indeed makes it really difficult to do because they don't want people doing it for obvious reasons. Um, so if, scraping Indeed is a whole another set of challenges because they change all their codes routinely too. Oh. So like what things were called one time won't be what they're called the next time because they know people want to scrape their services and they lose money if people do that. Um, so yeah, we got to the page we wanted. And then, as I said, we just use beautiful soup to parse all that HTML. And then we put the titles into a group. We put the votes and the authors into a group. And I just put those into a small data frame. Um, so these are the top posts on my login, on my account. I don't actually use Reddit that much, so I don't know even what's there. Um, but why do we vaccinate people instead of something has 513 upvotes, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Again, I don't use Reddit for almost anything, but um, I wanted a site where you had to log in and I wanted to show an iframe. So I knew Reddit did those things. Um, then the last thing I was gonna show was kind of getting linking us back to two weeks ago's presentation on Ajax. Um, so two weeks ago, Purav presented on, again, our website that we developed over the summer. And more specifically, he was showing how we use Ajax for dynamic search. So if you go to our search bar and you put in like the beginning of the word regression, it dynamically changes the inside. Um, which is a different type of search than like we saw with Google where it changes up in the URL. It adds the query to the URL. Since this is dynamic search, it's just showing up down here in our main um, blocks area, um, which makes it really hard as John pointed out when you want to scrape things because you can't just put in a list of URLs and say, scrape these 500 URLs and bring me back all the text from them. You actually have to use a tool like Selenium to do the search to bring in um, the information. So again, what it will do in this case, we're going to um, go back to the same website I was just on, the tool that we developed. I'm going to have it scroll down a little bit. Um, I wouldn't have to. I just wanted to show that you can scroll. Um, and then once it scrolls down, it's going to find the user input box. And that's what we called this search box. So if I right click and inspect this, this is the search box. And we um, the ID for it is user input. So it's just down here at the bottom. That's how I knew which box it was. And you can see when I scroll over it, it highlights it at the top. So I'm gonna pull up by ID and the ID we're looking for is the box called user input. I'm gonna put in just the beginnings of the word predictive. I'm gonna have it sleep and then I'm gonna have it do a screenshot of what it brought back. Now it's done and we'll download the screenshot.
And there you go, you can see in this box down here at the bottom now are the results from our search for PRED. So it's predicting, predict, prediction, and anything like that would be in there. And then if we wanted to web scrape it, you could just scrape that part of the web page and pull back all those results and do whatever you want with that data um, based on what's in there. So those are some of the case uses when a tool like Selenium is helpful. Again, it's not something you probably use all that often, but every now and again, you'll want to do something and there just aren't, it just has to have a tool like this where you can call up a web browser, put in passwords, go to places, click buttons, get what you want, and then get that data and then turn it off and do it again and again and again and again. Um, and that's really quite useful for some things at some points. Yeah. Okay, so that was my presentation on that. Um, I think what's amazing to me is how, like, I'm pretty sure neither of us have taken a class on any of this stuff. I've never taken a class. No, either of them. HTML, any of this stuff. And your presentation of it is exactly how I use it too. Like, we, <laughs> we've all, we basically have learned the same thing from completely different resources by just, you know, Googling around and reading the web and finding, uh, finding ways to do this. And I've used this tool a lot for scraping websites, um, mostly for gathering data from websites that are publicly available data. It's just, um, you know, you have to click through the page and save every page. And so I just automate it. Um, it's a very, very useful tool. And there is an R version of this as well. If you know R more, it's virtually identical. It feels very, very similar. So yeah, same overall. And process. there's a JavaScript yeah. version. Yeah. I'm sure they have it in lots. Um, yeah. And I think maybe the only difference is, so Selenium is sort of the, the browser remote controller and being able to click and do things on the browser. It's it's once you've got to a page and you want to extract something out of the HTML, that's where they, they differ a little more. So Python, you use beautiful soup and R, you use a package called Rvest, like harvest, harvesting things. Um, but they're all, again, also very, very similar how they work. Yeah, we did a session on web scraping last year at some point. So the video for that stuff. Yeah, and she did it in R. Um, right. And she she actually did scrape Indeed for job information. Oh. Um, so, which isn't, I mean, it's not impossible. Indeed knows that you're doing it. Yeah. And yeah. Um, I actually have been Indeed scraper on Colab. But what's interesting, it only run once. Okay. And then indeed will block you after that if it because mm -hmm. it will know that it was automated by the speed yeah. of it and stuff. But then if I go in like two days later, it will run again. But then it won't run the second time. So you have to get it right if you want to use a tool like because Colab won't let you set up proxies. So you can't bounce oh. around between a bunch of proxies. Like on your own server, you could yes. just keep telling it you're coming from different places and it would not be able to keep up with you if you wanted to scrape yeah. it like a hundred times. Yeah. But with this, they'll let you do it once, but not twice. So once you get your code right, you can run it once and it will give you the results. But then if your code isn't right, it won't let you go again. So you have to be pretty good at it. Um, but I'm afraid indeed we will find your accounts. Not. Well, I'm not logging into my account for oh, that. I'm okay, just doing regular yeah. searches okay. um, because their front site gives you quite a bit. Yeah. Um, and then you can follow the links from there pretty oh. easily with code. Um, yeah, so you can do it. It's just they're pretty smart people and they're figuring out ways to stay ahead of other. And I'm not that smart, nor do I have the motivation to try to keep up with them. But they do change things all the time. Um, there's also a similar plugin for LinkedIn. So for oh. international students, if you want to check if the company sponsors, there's a plugin called that like should be checker. It okay. uses Selenium to go and hunt and go through the US immigration website, check if this company has sponsored previously or not. And it will just fill a blank in front of each company. Yet it does sponsor, it does not sponsor. So it's easier for international students to apply to that. 
and screen mm -hmm. and it's if you use a cell in really useful to, uh, yes. very useful yeah it's a Again, it's one of those things. It's very useful when you have a use for it. It's not useful. It's not like, I don't know. It's not like pandas for Python people or whatever for our people where you use it all the time. Yeah. But every now and again, you have a challenge and it's like, oh, I have to have a tool that does this. Um, so yeah, it's great for those things. I used the request before, but yeah. This is my first time. So requests <laughs> works yeah. just fine, but only if your web page doesn't have, you know, that dynamic content yeah. like JavaScript that has to be rendered first before the thing that you want shows up. And that's where, like, so you go to a website, and if you see that when you do a search query and the URL changes, oh. <laughs> you'll be very happy. Yeah. That means that's a that's a not a dynamic site where, or it's not using the sort of AJAX principles that we talked about a couple weeks ago. It's it's going to be much easier to scrape. You can just manipulate the URL and then you'll get results back right away. If you do a search and the URL doesn't change, then you're like, okay, time for Selenium. And it's, you're going to spend a lot more time. Yeah. <laughs> it's, gonna, yeah. it's just going to take longer to figure out, you know, how to, how to do it. I don't even, see, I, I, I think some people consider this hacking. And I, I don't think so. I think we're doing, we're just, I think it's just pure Automation. We're just <laughs> automating what otherwise I could just pay a human to do this. I could say, go to this thing, type in my password, and click every page, and download the thing. And if a human could do it, yeah. then that to me is purely within within fair game. And so this is a, this is another whole another discussion. Maybe we can do that at the end of the semester, like have a discussion about ethics of hacking and stuff. This has gotten into court. This is a big level thing. There's gotten into yeah. court, court cases over this. You know, big sites like Indeed that all the revenue is based on their data. If I could go in and basically scrape your entire database through a browser, then I'm sort of stealing from you, but your content is made publicly available. It's just only limited by the ability of a human to click fast enough. So if I can automate that job, you know, I could have Selenium do the work or I could hire a thousand people to click all at once. What's the difference? I guess one, I have to pay. There may be some terms of service for any given website yes. that says how you, sh you should or shouldn't be able to use the data. Yeah. So for example, like if you think about like, you could put your code on GitHub and with different open source licenses, it doesn't necessarily mean someone could use it in a certain way. Yeah. So maybe the terms of service are the basis for those companies bringing lawsuits. That That's that's how they, you know, how it's getting into courts is, is all that fine print when you sign up for an account or something and you never read it, you just say, yes, accept and move forward. That's usually where there's all those limitations. And they say, you're not allowed to do this kind of thing, like ping our server 10,000 times in a minute or something. But, but some of it too, I mean, goes back to Google and people sued Google saying Google couldn't collect, it collect all, the, all the websites yeah. and cache them yeah. and make them easily searchable. Of course, they would have been shooting themselves in the foot because no one would ever find oh. their website. But then the courts came in and said, no, Google can take what you have up there and cache it and make it searchable better and all of that. So yeah, I, I think of the few court cases that have been higher profile like that, they've, they've generally gone down in the favor of the person scraping, saying, you know, your, your content is available to make it available. It's on you to kind of figure out a way to kind of protect that. Otherwise, I think it's great. And I don't know. I don't know how that all. I don't know anything about the legal side of all of this. But it's certainly like a uh, maybe. Maybe whether or not you collect the data is one level of ethics. What you do with it is maybe the second level of ethics. It's like if it's a bunch of personally identifiable stuff and you found that way to scrape it, and now you made that available to anybody. Now you maybe cross the line. Um, so anyway, that's a whole nother bag of worms, but I definitely have scraped a lot of sites for research projects. And I'm pretty sure, I've, am I on the record here? Yeah, Maybe. I can stop. <laughs> well, it's stop on the recording and then 